Here's what Salt Lake's talking about. National headlines are proudly announcing that honeybee populations are at an all-time high. Great news for us in the beehive state, except that we might have saved the wrong bee. It stings, but here's how we can right our wrongs. Today's Monday, May 20th. I'm Ali Vallarta, and this is CityCast Salt Lake. Jesse Margulies, you are a bee researcher. And a couple weeks ago on this show, I made a claim based on something I'd read that we saved the bees. We did it as a nation. Look what we can do. And you told me, Allie, not quite. So what's the rub? Well, it's kind of complicated. So we did save honeybees. Um, but honeybees are not the bees. They are just a bee. They're <laughs> one of 20,000 different bee species that are in the world. They are not one of the 4,000 native bee species that we have here in the United States. Um, so they were, I think you talked about it, they were domesticated, brought here for agriculture. Um, mm. And the USDA actually considers them as livestock. Um, yeah. So they are a bee that is really important for agriculture. Like 75% of the fruits and vegetables that we grow in the U.S. or about one in, fo- one in every four bites of food eaten in the U.S. is made possible because of honeybees. So it's awesome that we have honeybees and that their populations are doing well. Um, okay. It's, however, really only good for short-term food security, um, mm. not necessarily our ecosystems and the environment. Mm, what do you mean by that? So they are not native. Um, yeah. And we have 4,000 other native bee species here in the United States. How many in Utah? About a quarter of all the bee diversity in the United States is in Utah. So we have about um, between 900 and 1,100 native bee species in Utah. Good for us. Yeah. Um, the desert topography, our arid climate, all those factors play a role in Utah being a hotspot for bee biodiversity. Okay, so the native bees are in trouble. Why? One of the main reasons that native bees are in trouble is loss of habitat. Another one is actually directly related to honeybees. We have kind of bolstered up our Um, populations of honeybees because they are so important to agriculture. Okay. However, they are not native. They come in hives of anywhere from 20,000 to 80,000 bees. And when you put that many bees out into our native habitats, um, they oftentimes compete and outcompete our, you know, 4,000 native pollinators. So Mm. habitat loss, um, competition are main factors in why our 4,000 native bees are not doing very well. Are you saying that the honeybees are colonizing capitalist soldiers? (laughs) You know, that's one way to put it. And we are the beehive state. And so everyone's like, oh, hey, Utah, they love their bees. Yeah. But that goes back to our motto of, industry and you know we are utahns trying to be beehives and hard workers and all that so yeah our our native bees are not doing so well okay so here's the problem which i think we've already gotten to which is that if you want to get something done in this state you have to make an economic case so if we don't rely on native bees for food But what is it? One out of every four bites of food we take in this country are thanks to honeybees. What is the argument for saving the native bees? Because honeybees are livestock, we are able to put an economic value and quantify their net worth in crop production. Honeybees don't pollinate crops alone. Um, Native bees do play an important role in that. Um, Lots of plants are like cherries are actually not able to be 
pollinated solely from honeybees, native specific bees. Um, some pollinate in different ways, like sonicating or vibrating in the, the flowers and shaking the, the pollen loose. And so they play an important role um, in crops as well, but they're more so important in terms of biodiversity. Native bees are responsible for pollinating huge majority, like 80% of the flowering plants um, that we have here in the, in the United States. And those are not quantified economically in terms of like crop output, but they are extremely important for healthy ecosystems, wildlife, watersheds. And so we haven't yet quantified how important biodiversity is, but in terms of, you know, our climate crisis that we're facing, having biodiversity and a lot of it is one of the biggest factors that we have in um, having a resilient and healthy ecosystem. And so that is arguably more important than short-term food security. So when we started hearing about honeybee colony collapse, what we were told was start beekeeping, all of you. Go the way of David Beckham and put them in your backyard. And like cities, some cities even lifted restrictions so that we could do it. What can Salt Lakers do for these native Utah bees? Yeah, so one of the biggest things that we can do is give habitat back. I know there's a huge push to you know, get rid of your grass lawn, especially here in Utah and water-wise our landscape. We need to also be kind to our pollinators, our bee friends, and have our lawns and yards be pollinator friendly. Plant a pollinator friendly garden, even if it's just some flowers in a pot hanging on your, your balcony in your apartment complex. Everything that you can do to get native plants, um, you know, food essentially back in the ecosystem for these native bees it is going to go a really long way. And yeah, getting rid of those grass lawns is especially huge. Bees, 70% of them are solitary and actually nest in um, the ground or cavities. And so, you know, most of them aren't in hives like honeybees. So when you rip up that grass, restore the natural shrublands that we have here to your yard, um, you're actually giving back habitat that these bees can nest in. And then by also planting flowers, you're giving them the food that they need. So a combination of giving them back nesting habitat and then also providing them food will go a really long ways into helping out our native pollinators. Hmm. Okay. I'm always scared of growing flowers because I generally think they're more work than, I don't know, ivy. <laughs> But we one time had a guest on the show who was like, I think we should all just renegade garden. Like we should just get packets of seeds and throw them in the sidewalk cracks and see what happens. Is Can it be that easy? Like if if you're telling me, Ali, plant a pollinator garden, it doesn't have to look like Mary Mary Quite Contrary's garden, right? Like it can just be me maybe even letting some flowering weeds grow. Is Absolutely. that enough? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know flower gardens are a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Equally or maybe more um, important and much less work are like bushes, shrubs, and trees. You know, one flowering tree can be as many, put, or produce many, as many flowers as, you know, your entire yard uh, being a flower garden. So shrubs and bushes and trees, much less work than, you know, planting a flower garden and having to tend to that. And oftentimes just as important. What can state and local government do? Because there's always ways that I think policy can be engaged. Have you seen any interesting solutions coming from cities? So state and local governments can play a huge role in providing more habitat, a huge kind of buzzword. Uh, you did it. You said topic, it. You tough said topic. buzzword. <laughs> <laughs> tough topic that is always in discussion is our land use. Uh, Especially here in Utah, we talk about it in terms of water. Agriculture, a lot of maybe less than sustainable crops that are grown here 
we shouldn't be growing those. And an easy thing that we could do is to just give a lot of that land back. I think the USDA estimates that over 50% of the land use in our country is for agriculture. In a lot of states like Iowa, like 99% of native prairie lands have been destroyed and that's all habitat for not just bees, but a lot of animals. And so state, local, federal governments can play a huge role in returning native habitat and really helping these pollinators out. Another thing that's being done, citizen science is a huge thing and something that both governments and um, nonprofits and citizens can take a part in. The Bee Conservancy um, is a nonprofit and they, through iNaturalist, have a submission tool where you can go walk around Liberty Park, walk around your, your neighborhood and take pictures of bees that you see and upload them so that scientists through the state and research institutions can better track our urban bee populations and then implement conservation measure, measures to help them out. Jesse, I have to say, like, you and I are probably about a generation apart. And it's so interesting to me to hear you casually bring up land back. I mean, to me, it's an indicator that the normalizing land back movements has come a really long way. Is this talk among scientists like you work with and colleagues? Yes and no. I have a lot of experience in um, environmental education and conservation, whereas a lot of other scientists are strictly research focused. You know, they want to study, learn all they can and put out this information. I am of the mindset of, okay, now that information's out there, let's do something with it. You know, mm -hmm. why are we doing all this research? And it's, in my opinion, to understand and then implement policy, regulations, conservation measures to, you know, better help what we're studying. And yeah. so a lot of scientists, I think it is a generational divide. Um, you know, growing up, being a Gen Zer that I am, and just hearing of climate crisis, all the things that we're facing and my generation is going to be affected by. My generation of scientists are a lot more vocal and interested in talking about solutions and things like that, whereas a lot of others are more just research focused. So it really just depends on who you're talking to, um, what mm. researcher, but definitely more and more so with the younger generations, we are trying to create solutions and work our way out of some of the, the crises that we're facing. I want to talk about land back forever. Um, <laughs> I do want to ask you a little bit more about honeybees because now I'm becoming this ob obsessed with this idea that maybe they're the bad guys. And I know that the good guy, bad guy paradigm is like nails on a chalkboard to a scientist. But I saw this story in the New York Times about a journalist's house being overtaken by honeybees. They have this reputation of being hard to evict. Like there's this sort of sense that we've are maybe overwhelming ourselves or about to with honeybees by trying to save them. Is it ethical to kill a honeybee if we see it in our home? That is a very loaded question. Oh my God, um, no way, no way. <laughs> I mean, you know, the whether it's ethical or not, whether we should, you know, we talked earlier about how honeybees are non-native and they're getting out in our ecosystems and out competing. I've talked to people, there's mixed reviews on, oh, we should, you know, try to reduce the amount of honeybees that are in our native environments. If, you know, one gets into your home, like, is it, should we be trying to get rid of them? Like, what is, what should we and should we not be doing? And I mean, for you and many others, this is the first time that we are hearing about the maybe negative impacts of <laughs> honeybees. 100%. I thought they were the heroes of this story. And so, you know, they are important, but what we should be doing about them when they are causing problems is still new. And we haven't come up with definitive answers yet. You know, the first step is, is talking about it in education. And so it's great that, you know, we're 
we're talking about this and maybe getting a new perspective out and getting word out on some of the, the harms of introducing non-native species. Utah is known as the beehive state. You mentioned this. We love our bee puns. When they designed a new state flag last year, I think any one of us would have put $100 on that thing having a beehive on it, and it sure enough does. What is your favorite bee-inspired monument in our city? Yeah, so it's actually a mural. There is a painting on a building, an apartment complex. Okay. It's on 21 South and I think Main Street right across from Winco. There is okay. a beautiful painting of a, a bumblebee like about to land on the sego lily, our Utah state flower. <gasps> mm -hmm. It is yep. just so beautiful because it gets a native bee, our state flower. It's these bright pink and blue, yellow colors. And it's just, every time I go to Winco for the bulk section, it's like, <laughs> I stop and I look at it. Jesse Margulies, bee researcher. I learned a lot from you today, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me, I'm a big fan of the show. In March of 2021, the Utah legislature passed a bill requiring the Department of Agriculture to create a three-year pilot program improving pollinator habitats in Utah, AKA more bee-friendly gardens in our city. Now the result is this very cool native pollinator program where the state will cover some of the costs for you to plant a pollinator-friendly garden in your house or on a business plot. The deadline for this year has already passed but you can follow at Utah Pollinator Habitat Program on Instagram so that you don't miss any future application periods or in case they do any cool side programs. I put a link in the episode description. That is all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. Thank you for listening. We will be back tomorrow morning with more from around this city. Bye.